great pleasure and honor to be here. And uh, from that biography, you will have probably sensed that you now have to fasten your seat belts because <coughs> it's going to be a bit of a um, rough run through some of the problems that we are facing. Now, in our days, of course, everybody is talking about the Wall Street and the meltdown. And I shall be offering a few things which are certainly most controversial. Uh, let me begin with the thing that everybody is agreeing on, insufficient banking it's, uh, uh, oversight, etc. The returns on investment, 30%, that can't be sustainable. Everybody knew that, knew it for sure. But still, this was the yardstick and derivatives things, and blunders, and the arrogance, and uh, assuming ever-rising real estate prices, more houses when built than needed, and uh, banks in all of the place, including in Europe, were trusting that this was so. And those houses, far out, in the wilderness, I would say, got the triple A rating from the, from the rating agencies. All this is more or less common knowledge. Some uh, people have details to tell about what AIG did uh, and did wrongly, and oh. some s blame Alan Greenspan for low interest rates, and uh, I don't know what. Uh, this universe inside the banking system is full of good analyses and basically full of agreement. But I suggest that it does not serve to really explain what happened. And let me add a very controversial um, hypothesis that at least two additional factors have to be considered rooting back into the 1980s, which is now the golden age, isn't it? And Ronald Reagan, in 1981, I remember well in the campaign, was fighting against people he would call pessimistic, including all the environmentalists whom he didn't like, and liberals and others. And kind of declared optimism a patriotic duty, which was a good thing, after all. I mean, optimism is a great thing. I'm an optimist myself. But for rating agencies and such institutions, optimism is a crime. <laughs> they should be pessimistic. That's their duty. But that collid uh, collided with the patriotic duties. So that's one thing. And the other is, when worldwide oil prices tumbled, beginning 1982, countries like Germany, Denmark, Japan, and so, kept the end consumer prices high using taxes. While in America, under Reagan, this had no chance. So prices tumbled to the bottom, creating a new mindset in Detroit for having a new fleet conceived of and built, ending up with the SUV and Hummer idea, gas guzzlers. Um, mobile fortresses. And what is more important, because it's infrastructure, accelerated urban sprawl. Now this happens to be the 1990s because I didn't find the appropriate picture from the 1980s, but it was more or less the same trend. As in a matter of five years, you would see huge areas of America seeing a rise by 50% of what they call development 
meaning that the urban sprawl let the average commuter distances more or less double during those 20 years or so. I was just, just learning from Leslie that that may be part of a long-term story of, how do you call it? The manifest uh, destination, manifest destination, according to Turner, late 19th century, of filling this state, uh, uh, this country, with buildings, with people. Okay. But of course, the number of people did not increase that much. I mean, there was 30 million added or so, but not more. So, and then all of a sudden, in 2007, came the big awakening with oil prices <coughs> skyrocketing, commuting became a nightmare, houses lost value, mortgage loans above home values got non-performing, and that led then to, to the collapse of Fannie Mae, etc. And this, I believe, is at the roots of the present Wall Street crisis. Better banking oversight wouldn't have changed much of that. So, I warn against too much optimism with regard to better regulation of the banking system. That's fine. Let's them, let them do it. It's by all means a good thing, as long as it doesn't go too far into red tape and things. But unless you address the fundamentals, you hardly have a chance of remedy. Well, I said Japan, Denmark, and others, they kept the prices high and have hardly felt a shock inside from the uh, skyrocketing oil prices. The only shock they are feeling now is from Wall Street, not from the oil prices. So are, some of them are quite angry on America. So, I see this little story about the Wall Street uh, events as a prelude to my theme, Redirecting Technological Progress, wi on which I believe, Larry, we agreed uh, three or four months ago, certainly before the Wall Street <laughs> um, events. I could have gone directly to Thomas Friedman and his new book, Hot, Flat and Crowded, which in a sense was announced by a wonderful article that he did for the New York Times about a year and a half ago, which more or less encapsulates what he's writing in his book. But the book, of course, is worth reading anyway. It's about the climate questions. It's about the globalized world, as in his The World is Flat, and the problems of population uh, worldwide. But I'm not going to repeat uh, what he's writing in the book. But I'm extracting from his writing what we need, uh, why we need a green revolution and how it can renew America. He's very much an American patriot, as I see him. And then, of course, he observes that this is not sustainable, what you have today. And we, as Europeans, would say it's not good having a lead country showing a non-sustainable lifestyle that cannot, be pos cannot possibly be copied worldwide. But if you have one dream paradigm of which you know it can't be copied, that causes a lot of political frustrations and tensions and wars. So we need sustainable development. That uh, term was coined in 1987 in the famous Brundtland Report, meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own. That, however, will have to be concretized and one of the ways of doing it 
is looking at the area that we harness, that we um, put into the service of our daily needs, goods and services. And that has been estimated by the um, Global Footprint Network, the head of which is the Swiss um, researcher Matthias Wackernagel. They have their headquarters in Oakland, California. And they estimate the um, average American footprint, meanwhile, above 10 hectares. These figures are a bit old. And if you multiply 300 million Americans with 10 hectares, you end up with an area much larger, I believe twice as large or so, as the United States. So the US has to export their footprints into places like Canada, which is fine, Congo, which is more problematic, Brazil, Siberia, etc. But the Germans are not much better. The world average is about two. The world average should be actually lower than two, according to Matthias Wackernagel. So much for the ecological side of sustainable development. But in addition, we have the social side. For social side sustainability, we should not use the GDP, which is essentially a turn turnover measure. Instead, we better use the Human Development Index. And then you, we can draw a picture with two limiting lines. One, of course, we want a high Human Development Index, high quality of life, health insurance, and, and all these things. Education is all in the Human Development Index and a small ecological footprint. And that would then lead to the little lower right corner. This is where sustainability is. And now look to, look, let's look at facts. This is how countries of the world are distributed. And that sustainable development quadrant is essentially empty. There's one country in which happens to be Cuba, I don't know why. <laughs> um, all the African countries have far too little welfare, and the OECD countries have far too large footprints. This essentially is the challenge we should address. Now, of course, I love America. I love freedom. I love Consumption, I have to admit. But as a researcher, I'm interested in finding ways and means of making that compatible with the real world limits. Let's not imagine that's real world. This is basically the challenge we have to face. And remembering what was seen on this picture, sustainable development has a chance if we learn to extract roughly five times more HDI, human development, wealth, from one hectare of a footprint, or from one gallon of water, or from one kilowatt hour, or any other measures of natural resources that are available. So, more or less the same challenge with climate change. If we reduce our carbon footprints fivefold without sacrificing wealth, the problem would be solved. And I suggest it can be solved using technology, imagination, and appropriate economic instruments. Let's briefly look at the climate challenge. You have all seen that correlation between carbon dioxide and temperatures, just uh, as the 
scientific grounds. And then the third parameter, which is actually much more alarming, the sea level. I don't have the old figures from 650,000 years ago, but uh, the last um, uh, figures are quite telling. The difference between high and low being more than 100 meters, and you can see it at the coastlines during the last hot age, Italy was half as large. Um, I believe Alberto knows I Italy's uh, geography more or less. And about 20,000 years ago, Italy was nearly twice as big, uh, as large as it is today. Also, the U.S. is vulnerable, of course. Uh, actually, this one was from an Italian school atlas, which I was reading one day. This is uh, the U.S. coastline, of course, also big changes. If uh, Greenland uh, would collapse, much of uh, Florida and Louisiana, etc., would be gone. What is perhaps even more alarming is that there are big linear, ev non-linear events. About 7,800 years ago, Labrador and the Hudson Bay were covered by a big, big, thick ice mass, like Greenland today, about 3,000 meters thick. And in a matter of a few decades, it could have been a few weeks, that mechanically collapsed and glided into the ocean, letting the <coughs> sea level rise by some seven meters. And I mean, this has been published in Nature uh, nearly 20 years ago. And for some odd reason, uh, f beyond my understanding, is never reported, not even by the IPCC. But it's geological facts that are speaking to us. And now, we are sort of, as humanity, doing with Greenland what pre-human conditions did to Labrador and to Hudson Bay. <coughs> we don't know when, perhaps whether, this will mechanically collapse. We don't know. Something like one-fourth of Greenland is not sitting on rocks. It's held by parts sitting on rocks. And underneath is the ocean. But this is not a physically stable condition. It requires very cold temperatures. But now you see the size of fresh water covering Greenland in the summer, expanding, and vertical streams of fresh water running through the Greenland ice, lubricating the underground, at, at some stage, hopefully, after the 21st century, this may collapse. Now, the IPCC suggests that in order to stabilize carbon dioxide concentrations, what we have to do is to cut carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions in half, at least, they say 60 to 80 percent. But all energy demand scenarios say we're going to uh, go for a doubling. It's a horrendous gap which we are supposed to close. And then, of course, different countries contribute in different, to different amounts to that. I recommend to everybody to, from time to time, look at worldmappers.org. They have roughly a hundred pictures of the world representing, you know, um, biodiversity, water use, um, agricultural features, uh, etc., all representing the size of the respective countries. This is CO2 emissions. 
So you see that the countries that are fairly small in the upper picture, like the African countries and also some of the uh, Asian countries like Bangladesh or so, are relatively small. Um, and they blame the Europeans, the Japanese, and the uh, Americans, and increasingly Ch the Chinese, uh, for d doing all that damage. The answer could be, in terms of climate diplomacy, a global regime <coughs> of per capita equal emission rights, allowing the Africans and the Bangladeshis, etc., to sell emission rights to America at a price determined by the markets. That would create a strong incentive, both in Bangladesh and in America and in Germany, of reducing the carbon footprints. You would make a lot of money by doing exactly that. While today, you make a lot of money uh, uh, by doing the opposite. So the incentive structure presently invites us to do the wrong thing. But under today's diplomatic conditions in Bali, etc., etc., you see not the slightest hope because of the North, not because of the South, for that per capita equal emission rights regime. The reason is mostly because the rich countries say, well, we cannot sacrifice wealth. And the poor country says, well, we want to attain the same kind of wealth because there is a strict correlation between wealth and um, carbon intensity. This is empirical data. So what we need to get is an escape from that logic into what would then be called a Kuznets curve of decarbonization. Kuznets curve, that's this one. In Pittsburgh, you, you know about the Kuznets curve of pollution. 30 or 40 years ago, Pittsburgh was miserably dirty. It was at the rich and dirty part of the curve. And over the last 30 or 40 years, you managed to go down that curve into rich and clean which is fantastic. It's a huge success story for Pittsburgh, for the Ruhrgebiet, for the polluted centers of Japan and the rest. But so far, this Kuznets curve does, does not apply for energy use and um, carbon dioxide emissions. But this is what you have to do now. Now, what could decarbonization mean? There's of course nuclear energy, carbon capture and storage, renewable energies and energy productivity. I'm going through them briefly. Nuclear energy, that's a limited affair. I was learning yesterday that Westinghouse says it's, it's not doable for lack of uranium. That's absolutely correct. So uh, you have seen uranium prices rising tenfold over the last 10 years or so indicating some sort of scarcity. This is not the solution, aside from all the uh, problems with terrorism and war and, uh, and the whole risk. So, Carbon capture and storage, that's of course the love affair presently of the coal industry. They say, this is how we are solving it. Well, McKinsey, looked at the costs of reducing carbon dioxide. How much dollars would it cost to reduce one ton of carbon dioxide? And some are actually in the lower part, below zero, meaning that you, it's, you can do it at a profit. And some options are very costly. And about the 
costliest is carbon capture and storage. So why should we go for that? It's only because the coal industry wants to continue uh, selling coal. That's the only reason. There is no basic economic reason. It's lobby reason. But still, of course, you see, the American, the German, the Chinese coal lobbies all joining in carbon capture and storage propaganda. Renewable energies, that's a lovely thing. I was member of parliament when we adopted the so-called feed-in tariffs, which made for a fantastic success of wind energy and photovoltaics, really fabulous, but still it is less than 5% uh, or so of the energy pie. That's a new uh, idea of uh, harnessing ocean currents. The EU has looked into renewable energy supplies and I believe completely realistically foresee a flattening of those curves after 2020 or so. Because there are limits of space it's not so much limits of money, it's essentially limits of space. In photovoltaics it's also money. And that same EU vision, as you see, is talking about shrinking the energy pie. While the renewable energies are rising. The idea is not filling the old, wasteful pie, but shrinking the pie. This as the main agenda. And this correlates with the McKinsey finding. So this is the real agenda. This is all essentially about fuel efficiency, lighting systems, air conditioning, water heating, fuel efficiency in vehicles. Then there is one exception, it's sugarcane biofuel from Brazil. But that's a limited option, as you will uh, accept. Standby losses, industrial non uh, CO2, all this can be done at a profit. Well, all the renewables and nuclear are on the right-hand side. And yesterday's New York Times reported that the momentum is slowing for alternative energy and shares of alternative energy companies have fallen even more sharply than the rest of the stock market in recent months. For exactly this reason. It's the costly option. I'm all in favor of wind energy and all that. But I know it comes with a cost. So. Uh, well, let me briefly uh, touch the biofuels uh, story. I'm very glad uh, seeing one of your colleagues here who knows much more about it. It can be an environmental nightmare. In Malaysia and Indonesia, biofuels are by far the biggest environmental damage. So don't sell that as environmentally benign. It's economically problematic. On the European market for carbon dioxide, you pay roughly 20 euros per ton. And supplying biofuels of the equivalent of reducing a ton of carbon costs you roughly 100. It's socially disruptive, as you know. In Mexico, they had an uprise when the tortilla prices exploded because of um, fuel demand from America. So, it is a partial option, in particular if you burn agricultural and civilizational r residues. That's fine, but it's a very limited option. So, let's then turn to energy productivity, which essentially is my agenda. And for you to imagine what that could imply, let me give you a little task of elementary physics. The provost will, be, will have an easy time calculating. He's a physicist. So what's your guess 
about the number of kilowatts, uh, kilowatt hours that you need to lift a bucket of water from sea level to the top of Mount Everest. Any guesses from the floor? Typically, I get answers in my classes or uh, anywhere else, anything between 100 and 1,000, which is sort of a gut feeling. But in terms of essentially elementary physics, it's one quarter of one kilowatt hour. And the calculation is easier once you know that a watt second is one newton meter. And you can calculate it, that's very easy. So, that seems to suggest that one kilowatt hour is a true powerhouse. But we waste it no end, because it doesn't cost a thing. Who, right in his or her mind, would be willing for a honorarium of, let us say, 10 cents of a dollar, to climb up to Mount Everest and uh, delivering that bucket of water up there. <laughs> you know, it's a crazy idea. Unless and until we make energy prices higher, we have no chance of extracting the added value lying in those kilowatt hours or barrels of oil or whatever. And this is the main agenda, I suggest, for engineers in the 21st century. And this is what we have been addressing in that uh, book, uh, which uh, the provost kindly mentioned, Factor 4, Doubling Wealth, Halving Resource Use. My co-author was Amory Lovins from the Rocky Mountain Institute, an absolute genius, a fantastic person. Um, one of his concepts is the hypercar, which would do about 150 miles a gallon, compared with today's 20 or 30 miles per gallon. You can do that. That's a question of engineering, but also a question of capital investments. I spoke with the car industry in mostly in Europe, in America I had a little chance of doing it, uh, and their estimate is that something like 20 billion euros, perhaps more, would go into a hypercar until you have it in sizable numbers on the streets. And that, of course, requires them selling more than a million. It's not enough to have 50,000 idealists buying this thing. It, it's just n negative returns on investment, so it's not happening. And the only reason is that petrol is too cheap. Emory Levin's Rocky Mountain Institute, a fantastic place. They have a little tropical garden inside, and it's essentially energy neutral. He's allowing himself burning some biomass from his garden in the very cold winter days. And the rest, he says, is the heat coming from his stuff, from the bodies of his stuff. You don't need uh, 100 degrees Fahrenheit in your rooms. Uh, I think 75 or so is enough. So there is some scope of letting heat come down from the body heat. And the only thing that, uh, that you have to do is good insulation and heat exchange ventilation. And this is basically the philosophy. This is now architectural standard in Germany. My wife and I and one of our daughters and her husband and three little kids, etc., and uh, uh, have been building a so-called passive house last year, into which I shall be moving in uh, December. and. Uh, I called my wife yesterday night, she said, we have not uh, begun to heat. And that mid-October in Germany, it's colder than Pittsburgh, I believe, and 
for the whole season, I believe we have one bag of wood pellets. And this is for roughly 6,000 square feet of uh, living space. It's really very energy efficient. But this is architectural uh, standard now, not in America. There's yet something to be done here. Ed Masria is calling for it, and uh, from, I believe, New Mexico. So he's a, he's a great guy, a great pioneer in this field. The Bren School is a lead platinum building. It's not exactly a factor of four better than uh, other office buildings, but it's a factor of three in terms of energy. In my room, I have no air conditioner, and that's good. I love it. Then, of course, the transition to fluorescent light bulbs. The next generation is solid-state lighting. Again, at the UC Santa Barbara, we, we do that. There's Professor Shuji Nakamura, uh, who is producing new wavelengths of light so that eventually you have really white light. My friend Ryuichi Yamamoto from uh, Japan once uh, gave me that right-hand picture of a super robust steel which in the entire life cycle uses anything between four and ten times less um, resources for the same mechanical duties. Now, typically, a factor of four is not attainable if we look at efficiency of simple processes such as lighting. Uh, because it's, uh, you run into the laws of physics, thermodynamics, etc. So, um, you have to have a wider picture, which actually is also um, uh, Thomas Friedman's thinking. Look into systems changes, and then you wouldn't call it efficiency, you call it productivity. Efficiency is inside a box, while productivity is systems, cascades and things. So, in the next book that I'm presently writing, without Emery Lovins, he is uh, too much occupied with other things. Uh, my new co-author is Charlie Hargroves from Australia. Um, we are looking much more systematically into systems. One of the examples that we already had in Factor 4 was the logistics of manufacturing strawberry yogurt under uh, German conditions, which is absolutely crazy. Uh, lorries crisscross Europe, driving about 8,000 kilometers until that cup of strawberry yogurt is on your breakfast table. It's crazy. But in terms of um, business performance, it was good. Because labor is expensive and kilometers of lorry driving is cheap. Unless this is reversed, you won't get to the right-hand picture, which is a factor of eight or so better than the left one, or from urban sprawl to high-density cities. Now, this may take a hundred years. It's not done within one electoral period or so. Or seasonal diets, diets and organic farming, a little less meat will uh, yield a factor of four or so. In China, they are planning some 50 cities of more or less half a million inhabitants each. One of the first ones will be close to Shanghai, Dongtan. And they are meant to be at least five times more energy efficient than Shanghai is. In Denmark, in Kalundborg, uh, they have an industrial complex with cascading energy and um, industrial commodities running through the system so that essentially there is no waste, much of it is chemistry actually, and um, a very low energy consumption. And then vegetarian diets, of course, I mentioned that. Or if you replace uh, business travel by video conferences, I'm advising the Zurich in, um, Financial Services, and they have their headquarters in Zurich, but most of their operations are in America. And so when we have a, a meeting, 
it typically takes place for me in New York and for the Zurich people in Switzerland. And we sit at sort of one table, oval table. And the Zurich people sit on the other side and uh, we in America sit on, on, on that side. It is as if it was one room. It is really very real. The other thing is you have to deal with the, di uh, the time uh, difference uh, appropriately, but that's, that's a solvable problem. And it's a factor of 100 or so. So this is a new book. It's updated, more ambitious, focus on Asia, renewable energies, uh, systems and cascades, appropriate steering instruments, I'm coming to that, and the vision of a new Kondratiev cycle. Some of you well know those long cycles of the economy, and my uh, co-author, uh, Charlie Hargrove, suggests that the new uh, Kondratiev will be um, composed of uh, resource productivity, renewable energy systems design, remanufacturing, biomimicry, and the rest. Um, uh, it's more or less the factor five story. An early sign, a good sign, is that presently we see so-called green companies, Thomas Friedman is referring to them as well, have a better stock exchange performance than, than average. There are various phases of reducing uh, resource product, uh, of increasing resource productivity, uh, of reducing um, resource intensity. The first one is that classical Kuznets curve, which is also resource, uh, resource saving, then looking at goods, and the third cycle, according to Bob Ayers, um, who is, has been one of the great pioneers of this field, um, is then efficiency of service delivery, and this is the systems look. So we are going for a change of technological paradigms from essentially focusing on labor productivity to focusing on resource productivity. Labor productivity increased roughly 20-fold in the course of the Industrial Revolution. So we are suggesting now to at least increase tenfold in a hundred years or so, uh, resource productivity. It could be actually uh, faster, I don't know yet. Now is the question, coming to economic instruments, what was the driving force for the steady increase of labor productivity? And if you look at management decisions in industry, you see that labor costs have played the biggest role. But then, what was the main driving force for the 20-fold increase of wages? Economists would say it was labor productivity. So it's mutually supporting. And you can see it. This happens to be a time window of 50 years in America. There are certain periods when wages are ahead. This is what, in the political language, you call the liberal periods. And when wages are lagging, it's the conservative periods. But this is all more or less compensated by history. It's a, the political gambles and uh, fights are essentially about which way wages rank around uh, labor productivity gains. Now, but I'm therefore after this experience, suggesting politically is to actively, by state intervention, increase energy prices in line with measured energy productivity. Next month, I have a chance of offering this idea to the Chinese leadership. And um, I'm reasonably optimistic that they are going to buy it. So, actively elevating energy prices. Because market prices of resources do the opposite. There is a systematic decline over 200 years. And that thing that everybody has been complaining about uh, as of recent has just 
the, this little price hike has just brought us back into the lower confidence interval of the downward trend and come a little Wall Street crash and prices are tumbling again. I see no geological reason for prices to remain high, even for oil. You know, if you use the so-called Fischer-Tropsch um, technology for liquefying coal into petrol, and assume a very high coal price from West Virginia, so of $100 per short ton, which is far above present market, price, uh, present market prices. You end up with gasoline or oil of something like $80, perhaps $60 per barrel. So this is more or less what we would expect as the ceiling for oil prices for the next hundred years or so. <coughs> but in terms of climate, this would be a disaster. It would be much worse than digging oil from Saudi Arabia. So better don't go for that. Better actively, politically engineer prices upwards. Otherwise we have lost all those battles. We have no chance. But that's a political, uh, it's a heroic agenda for politicians to persuade people that this is, this is good for you to have prices moving up. It is good for you, but people don't believe it. Partly because they still share Vladimir Ilyich Lenin's preoccupation with low energy prices. This is Leninism. You have to overcome that, otherwise you won't get out of the troubles. Again, when I was member of parliament in Germany, we managed to get an ecological tax reform adopted. And surprise, surprise, uh, the um, carbon dioxide emissions from transport went down after the introduction of that tax reform, other than in Canada or America. The Chinese have understood it. When Jiabao, the Prime Minister, keeps saying that energy efficiency and the environment is their top priority, as one consequence, an international task force, Economic Instruments for Energy Efficiency and the Environment was established at the China Council. I was invited to co-chair that task force, and this is why I'm going to Beijing in, uh, next month, to advertise these things, of which I believe I know, would be excellent for China in terms of improving their economic efficiency. Now, let me come to an end by a little reflection beyond efficiency and productivity on sufficiency. What is that? It means enough is enough. And to co comprehend that, let us have a look at the economic growth in the kitchen over the last 50 years. That's how it looks. <laughs> the equipment, it's fantastic growth, really. And uh, all the instrumentation, uh, it really improved. And uh, the library, I mean, uh, now you can do Thai cooking and everything. It's fantastic. But now look at the Sunday dinner. Fifty years ago, it was exuberant and rich and fantastic. I love cooking, actually. And today, it's a little bit poor. So, thank you very much.